This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. like to introduce our next speaker who will talk about the basic science of some of the phenomena that I've just brought up to you. Dr. Patik Wadwa, who is an MD-PhD and is a professor of pediatrics, OBGYN, pharmacology and epidemiology. Whenever I see that, I'm going, this is a really smart guy. <laughs> At UC Irvine and has been one of the leaders in the field of developmental programming, what happens to mother and what that ultimately results in, in terms of the baby. Patik is one of the true leaders in terms of the basic science of this, and I can't wait to hear him speak. Please welcome him. So today I'm gonna, um, this should be up in a moment, um, I'll, I'll talk about the transgenerational effects of maternal stress and nutrition during pregnancy um, with a focus on, on offspring um, adiposity and metabolic function. And, um, this is um, ongoing work um, from our research program. I'm going to share um, some concepts and then some um, preliminary findings. So um, um, our program essentially concerns uh, the study of the nature and consequences of the interplay in human pregnancy uh, between biological, behavioral, and social processes and um, the, uh, the uh, uh, short and long-term effects on um, a newborn and subsequent infant child outcomes. So here's what I hope to um, sort of touch upon. Um, uh, talk to you a little bit about the general concept of fetal programming, but spend a, a few minutes talking specifically about the rationale for considering a role for stress and stress biology in this context. Um, I have two or three slides about uh, issues related to characterization and assessment as well. Um, then get to uh, some of the preliminary findings, uh, three sets of findings. Uh, the first relating um, uh, some uh, associations of stress biology in pregnancy with uh, nutrition in pregnancy. Um, the second relating stress biology in pregnancy with um, uh, newborn and infant adiposity related outcomes. And the third, um, just to give you a sense of where we're going, uh, looking at some brain um, outcomes as well, and, and talking about that in the context of um, adiposity. Um, so when I say we're concerned with uh, fetal or developmental programming of health, uh, what do I mean by health? And I really mean um, uh, this, this uh, major issue of complex common disorders. You're familiar with uh, these sorts of lists. These are the conditions that confer the major burden of disease, not only in developed uh, countries like the United States, but but now this really is a global problem. Um, the WHO says that these complex common disorders or non-communicable disorders um, are the single biggest um, threat not only to uh, health all over the world, but to development in general um, for, for lots of reasons. Um, there's uh, been uh, quite a bit of thought into uh, how are we to address this um, issue and um, <clears throat> the recommendations that are coming out from the WHO and other places uh, have to do with targeting um, essentially behavioral risk factors and uh, what they call four intermediate phenotypes, um, blood pressure, weight, uh, um, blood glucose, and, and blood lipids. Uh, but beyond that, they, they really don't um, uh, tell us a whole lot about what's to be done. So let's step back a little bit and, and look at um, sort of trying to figure out in, in, in broad terms, causation of complex common disorders. And what I would um, submit to you is that uh, for any given individual, you can think of her or his risk of developing a disorder such as adiposity or diabetes as a joint function of exposures for that particular disorder, whatever they may be, but then also the individual's predisposition so um, 
let me say a couple of things about, I, I don't need to tell you about uh, exposures or risk factors. Those are clear. We know uh, what the major exposures or risk factors are for um, uh, various disorders. Um, what's known but less appreciated is that there's quite a bit of individual variation given the same unit or the same dose of excess exposure to a risk factor. There's quite a bit of variation from one individual to another in her or his likelihood of developing the disorder. And, and that is, is, is how I'm using the term predisposition or vulnerability or susceptibility. And one of um, the interests is what uh, determines an individual's vulnerability or susceptibility. We, as I said, know quite a bit about uh, risk factors, but, but not as much about susceptibility. And the traditional paradigm, if you ask most um, clinicians or scientists, um, they'd say um, predisposition sits in, um, it's, it's part of, it's defined by genetic makeup. And by genetic makeup, they specifically are not uh, referring to epigenetics, they specifically are referring to variation in DNA base pair sequence. And they say that's what determines an individual's predisposition. And this is where there's a major divergence between the concept of what drives predisposition from this point of view and from that of the developmental programming perspective, which says, no, wait a minute, DNA base pair variation in and of itself is not a major contributor to predisposition, but it's the developmental process itself, which is the interplay of genetic makeup with the nature of the early environment. The emphasis here is on the term early. So this essentially is, is what the developmental programming um, paradigm would postulate, that the structure and efficiency of function of phenotypes is determined by this interplay during development, where um, A, it's interplay, and B, uh, there's a major role for conditions or environment during early development. Now, I, I think the, the distinction between genetic and environmental is at the bottom of the day an artificial distinction. It doesn't hold because genes don't do anything in a vacuum. They need transcription factors uh, for expression, uh, for the process of protein uh, synthesis. Um, the, the process doesn't get initiated de novo in the base pair sequence. Biological environment without genes um, doesn't do anything. It needs information or the recipe for how to put the protein together. Um, so so it, it, it's, it's really not a, a tenable distinction, but um, if you still persist in asking that question, I'd like to um, um, uh, uh, present a perspective. So when you say what's a pure genetic or a um, main effect of a genetic, you're really asking the question of what's genetic across all environments. And if you ask what's a pure or a main effect of an environmental factor, you're asking the effect of that across all the various genotypes that exist. So let's look at two examples. Let's look at the most dramatic transformation one can think of in biology and ask the question of what's the role of genes versus environment. And then let's look at the trait and condition that's been studied more than any other condition to date uh, with respect to genes and environment, and that happens to be obesity and type 2 diabetes. So of course the most dramatic transformation in biology is that where you take a stem cell and convert it to any kind of differentiated cell of your choice, or you take any particular differentiated cell and convert it to any other kind that you want to convert it to. What is the role of genes and environment? This, of course, was um, um, the, 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 the topic for which uh, the 2012 Nobel Prize was, was awarded, and, and Professor Yamanaka uh, spends a lot of his time here, in fact, at, uh, at UC San Francisco. Uh, go to the paper, you don't have to go far, just look at the abstract. What they did was changed the milieu, the transcription factors. They did not touch the genetic makeup, the DNA base pair sequence. In a sense, you can completely transform one cell type to the other without touching its genetic makeup by just changing the environment completely. Now, um, if you ask the question about um, well, what is the relative 
Um, and I'm going to defer a little bit with, with, with Bob because I think he was too generous in terms of the genetic component. So the issue of uh, genetic variation has been studied with respect to obesity and type 2 diabetes more than it has for any other phenotype today. Uh, perhaps thousands of studies involving uh, an aggregate of millions of people um, all over the world. Uh, here's a review uh, from last month published in Nature. They had a special section on, on obesity. They did uh, an analysis of all the known genetic variants. They assert that they account for less than 6% together. As Bob said, 10 kilos out of 30, that's a huge overestimate. Um, I mean, this is according to you know, the, the data presented in Nature last, last month. Um, let's look in contrast at a, a study that um, uh, maybe some of you um, uh, missed. I, I, I love this study. So here's a study published um, just last year. Looked at the entire population of Austria. A study that spanned, it was a retrospective study over a 100 year time frame involving the entire population of the nation of Austria. Looked at everybody who had type 2 diabetes and modeled the risk of type 2 diabetes initially from two things. One is age and the other is sex. Obviously expecting that individuals who are older have a higher prevalence in Austria than individuals who are younger. And knowing that the risk is uh, a little bit higher in males um, doing that. And, and of course they see a linear slope, an inverse linear slope with age and, and a small sex difference. But what they also added to this was a third variable what about if somebody happened to be born during or one year after a famine? And they tell us in this paper that there were three distinct famines in the nation of Austria in the last 100 years. And the bottom line is that the risk of type 2 diabetes, the excess risk over and above the effect of age and sex was about 40% being born in the period of a famine. So, so I don't need to speak too much more about you know the relative it's artificial, but, but if, if you... So the concept of fetal or developmental programming um, uh, involves the fetus doing three things. One, acquiring information about the nature of its environment while it's developing. From the very earliest phase of development, from embryonic life itself. And then using this information in the journey of development, which is essentially the journey from genotype to phenotypic specification. And, 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 and the phenotypic specification that results either by itself or in interaction with subsequent conditions in early life has important implications for health and disease risk. So if you accept this premise or at least this possibility, you'd ask uh, at least uh, the following questions. What phenotypes are you talking about? Which developmental conditions are you referring to? Uh, are all developmental conditions equally important or are some uh, more important than others? Um, how? How does this work? And um, you might ask a question about the hierarchy of programming effects. And I'm just going to mention something about that later, but not really talk about that. Which phenotypes? So. Um, so, so I would suggest to you, um, if, if one uh, steps back and again uh, takes a look from the perspective um, not just of developmental programming but evolutionary biology, um, the one central uh, defining characteristic of life is its ability to adapt to changes in environmental conditions. And these adaptations at the end of the day require adaptations in the capture, storage, and utilization of energy, because this is what drives everything else. This is, uh, I'd, I'd suggest to you, uh, the single most fundamental process uh, that exists. And so those phenotypes that relate to energy capture, storage, and utilization would be those that would be expected to exhibit more developmental plasticity than any other phenotypes because that's what they're related to, to understanding what the state is of energy and of adaptations to that state. Which conditions, therefore, would be, I'd suggest, conditions related to energy substrate and mortality risk till reproductive age. Now, here, nutrition and energy substrate, the two uh, 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 separate roles, they're, they're overlapping, but they're not the same. Of course, one needs energy 
to grow and develop. But a developing organism over and above using energy to grow and develop wants information about the state of energy in the environment. In what forms is it present? How much of it is there? How stable is the supply? Questions like that. And, 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 and these would then be expected to be um, a key signals or cues that represent this would be key signals in the programming of phenotypic specificity over and above adequate energy to grow and develop, both macro and micronutrients. How? Now, one could hypothetically imagine two scenarios. A developing organism could somehow uh, magically place sensors all over the place in the fetal compartment, in the placenta, in the maternal compartment, in the external environment, and get information from these sensors. But the other possibility is to use a system in the maternal placental fetal interface that plays precisely this role in modulating energy. So look at this system and the behavior of this system to get both cues about both short and long-term energetic state. And what would such a system look like? I would submit to you that it would be stress physiology or stress biology because that is the defining purpose of this system to mediate energetic responses to variation in environmental conditions, not things like fight or flight. Those are a consequence of doing this and not the other way around. And therefore, phenotypic specification of traits related to that, that exhibit developmental plasticity would be expected to rely substantially or heavily on variation in you know, cues that are represented in the stress biology system. Now, I'm not going to discuss this in length with you, but turns out that there are three possible roles for stress biology in development. One, um, eventually the embryo and fetus uh, has to be acted on biologically, regardless of what the upstream determinants are. And there's no perturbation I know of that doesn't influence stress biology, endocrine and immune processes. Two, um, there's lots of information on both direct and indirect communication between the maternal and fetal compartments mediated by stress bi biology. And third, there's a very impressive amount of growing evidence about the obligatory roles that these ligands, like glucocorticoids and cytokines, play in normal development of both the brain and all peripheral systems. I do not know of a system um, that's an exception to this, where you wouldn't expect a role for glucocorticoids and cytokines in normal development starting from as early as stem cell differentiation and going all the way through. So that brings us to the overarching hypothesis that stress biology may serve as a sensor, transducer, and effector of environmental conditions on the developing embryo and fetus. So we've been interested in this question for quite a while. I'm not going to walk you through uh, you know, all the specific questions about the role of maternal stress and stress biology in fetal development, um, but two comments here. When we started, and when many of us, uh, at least who come from the behavioral medicine sort of perspective, look at this, uh, this is the sort of um, formulation we come up with. We, we, we think of something such as psychosocial stress as representing stress. Uh, we think of one biologic process. Many of us think of hormones and particularly glucocorticoids as the endocrine mediator. And then we uh, try and link this to um, outcomes of interest. But the two points I want to make are, if psychosocial stress perturbs the endocrine system, so do several other things such as hypoxia, infection, trauma, and malnutrition. There is no one-to-one -one correspondence between any kind of environmental condition and a biological state. There is no biological state that isn't affected by multiple uh, conditions in the environment. This isn't just a point of academic interest, but the effects of psychosocial stress would differ on glucocorticoids based on the nutritional milieu or based on the inflammatory milieu. There are no pure or main effects, the conditional effects, marginal effects that depend on the state of um, other co conditions in the en environment related to other factors. The second point I want to make is, regardless of the source of the perturbation, if something perturbs, for example, the endocrine system, 
you're going to get secondary perturbations in many other systems, such as the immune system, the vascular system, the brain. Again, this isn't just a point of academic interest because these secondary perturbations are going to act on your primary system of interest and alter the effects of your primary exposure of interest. And all of this, of course, has to be understood in the context of, of genes and epigenetic processes, both between the exogenous challenge and the biological response and between the biological response and the targets of interest. So that's what um, um, we, 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 we try to get a handle on in, in prospective longitudinal um, uh, human studies. And um, we've been asking this question of which women under what conditions at what stage of gestation might be vulnerable to the potentially detrimental effects of stress. Um, we use approaches um, called ecological momentary assessment in the current studies, but um, uh, because of, uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to describe these. Uh, I'd like to make a couple of uh, general points about um, endocrine immune interactions in pregnancy before getting to the data. So uh, we've already heard very elegantly about uh, some of the alterations in, uh, well, we've heard them more about inflammatory and immune processes in function, but the state of pregnancy also changes endocrine processes. And, and I'm going to submit that it's important to characterize both of these and to look at multiple aspects of each of these. So one example that I'll give you with uh, cytokines, we've characterized cytokine profiles uh, in unstimulated and, and upon antigen stimulation across the course of gestation in early, mid, late gestation. Um, if you were to just look at one cytokine like, um, and, and Dr. Catalano is talking to you about some of the inflammatory cytokines like TNF-alpha or IL-6, and use that as a marker of, let's say, increased um, inflammation or CRP. Uh, that might not tell you a whole lot because, um, and we can show you lots of data from different studies. If you look at baseline state, most of the pro and anti-inflammatory uh, uh, cytokines strongly correlate positively with one another. So when you have high pro-inflammatory, you also have high anti-inflammatory, and the reason for that is one of those is a, a response to the other. And you can't tell by just looking at one whether this is because something's driving inflammation or whether this is a compensatory response to something that has dampened the anti-inflammatory effect. Exactly the same with glucocorticoids. From high glucocorticoids, you have no idea whether it's because of an exo exogenous drive or whether it's an attempt by the system to compensate for glucocorticoid receptor resistance. So you have to develop Profiles in this case, we've we've taken to looking at uh, pro and anti-inflammatory balances. Uh, if if you can't do more elegant things like uh, actually doing challenge uh, uh, studies to uh, to tissue like blood or PBMCs, and there's lots of data now preliminary. Um, we're developing in pregnancy where we're uh, demonstrating relationships of, for example, glucocorticoids with both circulating and uh, with antigen stimulated. Uh, levels of both pro and anti-inflammatory cytokines for glucocorticoids, for CRH, for estriol, um, which is a very, very interesting um, hormone during in, in primate pregnancy. It's one of the few hormones uh, that is a biomarker of fetal adrenal activity only in primates, and it's the primary estrogen in pregnancy. But uh, So, for instance, in this data slide, um, we looked at the correlation at 10 to 12 weeks gestation in a maternal blood, uh, ex vivo, between CRH levels and basal and stimulated levels, LPS stimulated levels of TNF alpha, and, and um, it got cut off here, but we saw the same results for IL-1 and IL-6. Um, and what we see is there's no correlation at basal state. So regardless of maternal CRH levels, um, uh, no correlation with, in this slide, TNF alpha. But when you present the whole blood with an antigen, in this case LPS, and you look at the antigen response, which is in the dark circles, the same subjects, the open ones are baseline state and the dark ones are LPS stimulated, then you see this pretty good correlation with uh, CRH stimulated um, um, uh, cytokines, suggesting that, that, that CRH um, potentiates the inflammatory response. So those are a couple of examples. Now moving to outcome studies, uh, we're looking 
in our cohort simultaneously had two sets of outcomes, one related to growth and body composition and the other related to brain development. With respect to <coughs> body composition um, and, and the issue of, uh, so of course you know it's a mathematical impossibility for a lean person to become obese unless energy intake exceeds energy expenditure, the transition from lean to obese, but as we've heard from uh, the previous speakers, um, there's a lot more to it than that. The energy intake equation has, has things to do with how much one takes in and what. Both of those are very important. And the energy fate has to do with a, a BMR, which uh, there's a very important role for mitochondrial function, adipocyte biology, Dr. Lustig told you about these, uh, pancreatic function, the insulin receptor, PPAR gamma activity in the liver and so on. We've written about how we think stress biology influences both sides of this equation in ways that contributes to susceptibility for, um, for um, adiposity. Uh, but to move on to some data, so we do assessments during pregnancy and then at birth and at six months and one year, we measure um, body composition with DEXA and now with MRI. Uh, we do doubly labeled water for energy expenditure and then we get um, a blood from the infant for measures of insulin and, and uh, glucose. So, uh, of course, I don't need to tell you about the importance of looking at both nutrition and stress together because um, the several folks, including, uh, for instance, uh, uh, Dr. Eppel here has shown that the effects of one depend on the state of the other with respect to biology. So. The effects of stress on biology in part depend on the nutritional milieu and the effects on nutrition on biology in part depend on the stress milieu. Is this so in the case of pregnancy itself? So I'm going to, I've already been given the, uh, the, the, the warning that I need to start wrapping up, so I'm going to sort of fly through some of the data. So here's some data on uh, speaking to the importance of pre-pregnancy BMI and placental CRH production in pregnancy now. <coughs> CRH production is placental, placenta is a fetal organ, and so here you've got maternal state before pregnancy being correlated with the production of CRH over the course of pregnancy. You've got similar findings in our data with pre-pregnancy BMI and C-reactive protein, which as you know is a very non-specific marker of inflammation, again speaking to the point that not only is pregnancy a pro-inflammatory state, but the variation in inflammation seems to be related to pre-pregnancy BMI. We also have data on maternal diet quality and cortisol across the course of gestation. Here an inverse relationship, good diet quality associated with lower cortisol over the course of gestation. Very similar findings um, with um, IL-6 um, and, and CRP, again in the expected direction. Now how does this relate to newborn uh, and infant adiposity? So here we looked from DEXA data at change in fat mass from birth to six months because this has been shown to be a particularly interesting variable in terms of risk for future adiposity and metabolic dysfunction. And um, the, the values of body fat at birth at six months and the change in general is, is, is as expected and it's consistent with the data Dr. Catalano showed you about the proportion of body fat human newborns have. So when we look at the change, and when we look at what are the prenatal stress biology factors that relate to this, again, um, we're seeing, again, in small samples, and these are preliminary data, a relationship here with, um, um, with, with cortisol, such that the more the cortisol over the course of gestation, the more the change in uh, fat mass from birth to six months age, Here's similar findings for IL-6 in pregnancy. IL-6 is very stable in pregnancy. It doesn't seem to depend too much on when you look at it. Um, we're very excited to be um, using fetal ultrasound to interrogate uh, other fetal physiological processes, uh, in this case, fetal liver blood flow. Um, um, because of time, I'm not going to explain the significance of blood flow through the liver, except that it's a major shunting and there's organs that are supplied before and after the bifurcation in the liver, and, and, and there seems to be, we were very interested, this, uh, to the best of my knowledge, is only the second report to demonstrate fetal liver blood flow in, in uh, the second trimester with change in fat, no, this is not change in fat mass, this is newborn fat mass, 
Um, we've begun working on the issue of, um, you know, can we, fat, all fat is, you know, fat is not fat. You've, you, you all know the story about brown and white fat. And we've become interested in uh, two things. One, are there techniques in humans to differentiate fat mass into brown and white adipose tissue in the human newborn? We believe there are. We've made the assertion that there are using um, MRI, and we published on that and, 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 and said we can quantify um, fight, uh, white and, and brown adipose tissue. Uh, we're doing that in our studies now. And even though this is a very small sample, only 17 babies, I, I, I'm really thrilled to see such a tight correlation between what we're asserting is, um, is um, uh, brown fat and total energy expenditure measured with doubly labeled water. So this, this is saying that there's something here. I'm going to not show you the data slides on the brain, but just make a couple of points. So we're doing brain imaging in these same babies. And as Dr. Lustig told you, um, there's several targets that relate to control of um, adiposity and metabolic function. These are structures, particularly within um, the hypothalamic nuclei, and they're tracks that define the white fiber connectivity in many of these regions. And then there's the functional aspect. So when you have a tract anatomically, that doesn't necessarily mean the connectivity is good or bad. Without a tract, there, there can't be connectivity, but with one, that there isn't necessarily a connectivity. And we're looking at brain anatomy. These are some findings of IL-6 during pregnancy with the volumes of the right and left hippocampus and amygdala at birth. Um, not going to walk you through the findings. Uh, these are with DTI looking at fiber tracks, again showing associations um, in many of the fiber tracks of interest even in the context of adiposity with IL-6, for example, in pregnancy. These are data looking at a resting state fMRI in newborns, which looks at functional connectivity in the brain and those same regions um, that, that um, are related to these fiber tracks. So this was just to, uh, you know, tell you that there are uh, approaches that are possible to look at many of these questions quite carefully. Um, in terms of the hierarchy of developmental programming effects, these are the last two slides. Um, again, not going to discuss this in detail, but I've been interested in two questions. One, in a cell, where would programming start? And then across cell types, which cell types would programming start in? And, and my um, hunch <clears throat> is that the two most basic components of a cell are those biological mechanisms that take care of and maintain the DNA molecule, both in its structure and folding. And that, of course, is the telomere biology system. And the second is that which maintains the health and function and vitality of mitochondria, because that's where energy production occurs. So those, I suspect, would be the two targets where this whole process of fetal programming starts in a cell. And then if you ask me which cell types, when does this thing start, I would say, well, from the very beginning from the trophoblast, from day five, and, and uh, I don't have data on that, but I can certainly uh, another time show you data that shows that for stem cells to even start differentiating, you need um, some of these ligands related to physiological stress. So then in conclusion, I want to suggest that stress biology offers a unifying framework in the context of questions and studies about the determinants, processes, and consequences of mammalian adaptations to environmental variation during development. And then um, I think the, the, the emphasis on primary prevention is obvious. All of you know it's difficult to reverse this, much more difficult to reverse some of these phenotypes than to not develop them in the first place. But, and this is a slide I've, ha I've, I've had even before Dr. Catalano's talk. Really the target for prevention in terms of the population, it's too late during pregnancy. It's far too late when she's already pregnant and the focus has to be if you have to pick, of course it should be everybody, but if you have to pick, if you don't have the resources to focus on everybody, it has to be girls and women of reproductive age, particularly girls, even before they get to reproductive age. We have data on, uh, for instance, um, uh, child abuse in, in our samples and the effects on pregnancy physiology and so on that I'd be happy to share with you another time. So, um, uh, we, we have a fantastic group of uh, colleagues and collaborators, and I also 
have a fantastic group here among the many at UCSF, and, and, and Alyssa is one of them, and as is um, uh, Nikki. So thank you so much.